All right, welcome to the Multifamily Growth Cast, hosted by the Multifamily Mindset. This is Tyler Devereaux here with Jackson Simmons Campbell. That's I me. Love, I just love your middle name, bro. Dude, we haven't been here. We haven't been together. We haven't been able to record for a couple of weeks because yep. of some traveling things. We had to do a couple episodes up front. So I'm, I'm excited, man. I feels love doing it. good to be back, bro. It does, dude. It just feels right. <laughs> Recap, the last drip, I think, was about business partnerships, which was a fun one for me to chat about, man. I love that one. I love going through the problem-solving system. If you haven't listened to that, uh, go take a look, man. Go take a, a look, a uh, listen. Listen. Or listen. look, it's on YouTube. Yeah, you can also look take at a watch. how you can make changes while you listen. That's what I would do. There we go. Take notes for sure, <laughs> for sure. No, there was a little. We kind of went off on a tangent during that episode about a problem solving system, and it was awesome. Sweet. So if you don't, if you didn't listen to that episode, definitely go back and listen to it and listen for that section because it really was super, super valuable. And then when you grab something from it, what do they need to do? They got to share it. Share, you like, share rate, it. review. You know, pay yeah. the price. Yeah, pay the price. <laughs> All right, what are we talking about today, my man? So today you just exited. Today we want to talk about. You just exited out of one of your passive investments, mm -hmm. and I want to talk to you today about how you screen those deals for passive investments, right? You, yeah. you invest actively all the time, but you also inve invest passively. Totally. So let's talk about – I want to talk about that. How do you go about identifying those passive investments? Love it. Yeah, definitely, obviously, invest actively putting deals together, but, dude, I'm always investing passively. In fact, I would say the – I mean, the far majority of my money by far – that that I have invested is in multifamily properties. And it's the same thing that I that I do, just different properties. Um, and I love this question because it's so important, man. Like most people don't even know that they can, that they can invest passively into deals. I didn't, at least. I definitely did not know. Right. And so when I find out, I was like, shit, amazing. Let me throw some money into this thing. But I had no idea how to vet these deals. Right. So I look at. Six different pieces. Okay, the operating partners. I learned that the hard way on my first on my first deal. That that is um, that was that's like the most important aspect, in my opinion. The operating partners. Who are they? What's their backgrounds? We'll get into some of those details, I'm sure. But yeah. also just the investment strategy of the deal. You know, for example, let's say a major reposition, which is just a lot of construction, a lot of work. That's not a fit for an investor that um, you know has immediate liquidity needs. Somebody who a major reposition doesn't cash flow for a year or so, right. or maybe two. So what kind of, what's the investment strategy? What's my goals, right? Uh, also the market that they're investing in. I want to know some of the, the uh, details there. The story of the deal, that's always important to me. Like why, why they are, you know, the current owner is selling. What's the story? And does the story make sense? Uh, the business plan is number five. Okay. And then just the underwriting. The underwriting projections are key too. Like are they conservative? Are they aggressive? We can get into all these details as, as deep or as surface level as you want to, but you know, in 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 short, like each market and each asset class is, they have a different strategy and it's unique. And so, like as a group, as a as multifamily capital partners, our investment group, we focus on value add properties, right. so value add multifamily deals, right? Uh, and I that's what I prefer as a passive investor as well. So value add deals. So you you mentioned. You've, the very first thing is operating partners. You yeah. want to look at that, and then you mentioned that you also learned in your first active. Oh, is that your first active investment? No, first passive. Your first passive investment. Yeah. You learned the hard way there. Yes. To, why would you say? So you'd say operating partners is the number one thing you need to look at. Totally, man. Why? So my first deal. So and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say this too. I have actually, I actually have a, I have a um, deal screening checklist put together. Yeah. Uh, that we can share. So we'll put that in the in the show notes and. Sure. You know, whatever we go through, it'll be way more detailed on that. That's for sure. So we'll put that in the show notes. You can jump in, download that, but it'll help you screen shit. Dude, that'll help you screen passive or active investments, I believe. That was great. But my first passive investment that I ever did, um, you said I just exited my first passive investment, but that's not the first passive investment that I ever did. It's the first one that we've exited. Sorry. Uh, Correct. Pa passive side. Yeah. But first passive investment I ever made, man, I had, I, dude, I had no idea what questions to ask. No clue. I just was like, okay, these people have a deal, and I have some money that I want to put into a deal. So, I mean, what could go wrong, you know? Yeah, so what, que what kind of questions are you asking when you're when – Yeah, you're we'll get into it. Dude. Okay. I'll tell you the questions that I asked. Okay. But, you know, what happened is I essentially I invested in a – dude, a, a decent deal in a pretty decent market with horrible operators, just bad operators. You know, real estate was booming, but my investment was uh, – dude, it was a, it was a, it was a bust. 
and you know, hopefully it will turn around at some point. But right now, it's still not ideal. Okay, <laughs> have not seen a dime from any of that. So once again, I want people to. I don't want people to make those mistakes. You know, I learned that the number one factor behind deal performance are the operators behind it. There's going to be curveballs on every deal, right? Which means the operators better be experienced and dedicated enough to handle that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, operating partners are the most important, in my opinion. Um, what questions did I ask? Is that yeah, yeah, that's what. Yeah, that, what, how do you go about vetting those? So, questions I ask the operators when I'm on the phone call. Okay, first, what their background is, and hopefully they've sent me all this stuff before. Like I'll tell you, very rarely the questions that I'll tell you, very rarely do any. Do, does anyone need to ask us as an operating partnership about these questions? Right. Because we bullet point all of it in our property packets. You've seen those, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Because I know what their questions are going to be. How do I know what their questions are going to be? Because I've, I've raised money on a whole bunch of deals, and I've been asked the same questions a million different times, and I've asked these questions. And you're on that opposite side, too, where yep. you've, yeah, you've been the one asking them. So what's their background? You know, I want to know how long they've been syndicating deals for. I want to know how long, you know, the team that they're working with, how long have they worked together? How many deals do they own together as a partnership? What's the track record of those deals? Uh, how, many, how many deals do they own in that same market that we're, that they're, you know, this, this deal, this opportunity is in? Uh, is it their full-time focus or is it part-time? I want to know those kind of things for sure. Uh, do they have somebody boots on the ground you know, that live in the area to oversee the property management? What are they using property management or are they the, th- the property management uh what's their track record you know they we always pro- you know show these things too like hey this is our average projected return right what we project we're, we're gonna hit yeah, yeah, yeah. and this is our actual return right yeah i want to know what their track record is where the, from what they've projected to what they've actually hit what is it yeah that's obviously telling um and then are they investing any of their own money into the deal i believe that that question is super telling for sure Like, are they investing their own money? We invest in every single syndication deal that we put together because do we believe in those deals? You know, we we believe in those deals. And also, man, we want to make sure that we're equally aligned with our investors. That makes decision-making so easy throughout the process because it's like, and trust throughout the process. It's like, hey, man, we have have money aligned (laughs) and, you know, invested with you. Like, trust me, we're making decisions in line with that. And I could say that all day, but until I have money, in there that's or they have money in there that's you know very telling in my opinion yeah and kind of going back just a little bit to one of the other things that you brought up about their 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 track record or their performance and you, yeah. you have to look at that yeah right i remember you making a, a, an example one time do you want justin james on your team or lebron james right you want to definitely <laughs> you definitely want to look at those stats yeah. of what those operators are doing so you know Totally. That, that that's a good deal. Who's Justin James? I don't know who Justin James He's is. He's actually a real player. That's the point, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we want to know. Exactly. Now listen, man, everyone starts, right? Yeah. Everyone's, everyone has to start somewhere. But my opinion, uh, you need to be partnering up with people who are more seasoned when you start. For that's sure. what I've done. That's what I teach people to do. Why? Because it's credibility. And number two, you're not going to know it all, man. I, that is a fact. When people come to my events and they're like, oh, I'm just going to do it on my own. I'm good. It's like. I cannot even imagine having that much pride. Like, yeah. I still do not even, I'll never know it all, man. I look back five years ago and I'm like, holy shit, I was winging it back then. Yeah. But I know I'm going to look back five years from now and be like, holy shit, I was winging it back then, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So first thing is, is screening, vetting out those, those, operating, yep. those operating partners or the managers there. Second thing you said is the investment strategy of the deal or yeah. the business plan. Why? Every every str- what, or what, I guess a better question is what are you looking for in that business plan and that strategy? Yeah, I'll answer I'll answer both why and what we're looking for because every you know investment every every strategy and I'll go through the different strategies but every strategy has different pros and cons and different risk levels right? Yeah. So that's one of the it's a huge thing too man I want to know what the risk tolerance for when I'm actively investing. I want to know what the risk tolerance of my investors are so I can let them know, is this a good fit for you and, and what you're looking to accomplish or not? If it's not, dude, I'm, I'm going to tell them this right. is why, right? right. So I'm, I'm going to figure that out too. Every, every, as I'm uh, passively investing, you know, every strategy has different pros, cons, that kind of stuff. So, and everyone has a, a different idea of what risk is and how much you know, they're comfortable with. So some investors look for the highest returns possible. They're not too concerned with risk. And some syndicators think the same way. So, so a conservative investor, they focus more on 
income generation out the gates, right? Th those individuals should be, per should be investing in higher quality properties with you know, low leverage or in a fund that is diversified uh, across a bunch of different properties, high-end properties. You know, those with a bigger appetite for risk, they're going to be, you know, that are, are more focused on this long-term equity horizon, value add, or maybe even some opportunistic, you know, reposition type deals. We, we toe the line. Like, I prefer to toe the line on conservative and mildly aggressive, right? So these light value add deals in secondary tertiary markets, I believe that that niche has this, it, it, well, not believe, I know for a fact that that niche has been able to weather, you know, volatile downturns and also has strong upside. So it has safety, but it also has upside, right? Yeah. Do you want to get into those specifics at all? Or sure. Why? Name, the, there's four basic strategies, okay? Yeah. Um, and I won't get into tons of the details, but the four basic strategies, there's what's called core okay. real estate investments, uh, core real estate investments. And, you know, anybody who's listening to this who is a passive investor, you should be taking notes. Anybody who's listening as an active investor, dude, you should be listening and taking notes and know how to talk about these things, right? So core real estate investments, that's core. I look at core equals income. So that's best for conservative investors. The annualized returns lower, 7 to 10% annualized returns, right? So that would be an example of that. That would be like a fully leased building in Manhattan that has little to no deferred maintenance and cash flows out the gate, right? That's a core real estate investment. So you're more, you're protecting your downside, but you're definitely limiting your upside there. Okay. Number two would be core, it's called core plus real estate investments. Core plus is there's some income, but there's also some growth potential. So this okay. is low to immediate, you know, low to, to, to moderate risk, maybe 10 to 12% annualized returns on something like that. So a little bit of an older building, maybe 15, 20 years, it's still you know, well-occupied, just needs some light upgrades. A, uh, uh, number three would be, and this is where we typically focus here, this is right. our bread and butter, which is value-add real estate investments. Uh, value-add means growth. So that's, that's moderate to high risk, depending on what you know, side you're on. Little to no cash flow. Sometimes the cash flow is out the gate, but most of the time there's little to no cash flow at acquisition, but with potential to produce a lot of cash flow and a lot of equity. You that's know, where that business plan comes in that you were talking about. Yeah, and that's that's another aspect of it. Like, what is the business plan? Yeah, How do right. they plan on raising the rents? And it, are those conservative? That kind of stuff. But yeah, value add. You yeah, know, what what, yeah. what what value can we add to the property? And most of our deals, we project sixteen to twenty percent. I, I expect that for any passive investment that I'm going to look into as well. Um, and then opportunistic or uh, major reposition deals. Those are opportunistic is you know, risky. It's it's I, I would classify that as risky growth. So it's the riskiest of all real estate strategies. There's no cash flow for a couple of years, maybe even more. But there's, you know, potential for high amounts later. So that's, you know, 20%, 20 plus annualized returns on something like that. But it's a riskier deal, right? Why do you look for the invest? Why do you, why do you pay attention to the market, right? Because I know you do. I, why, why is that? Um, I was trained by Dave Lindahl. Okay. You know that. Yep. I love Dave. And Dave stressed this, man. He has this book called Emerging Real Estate Markets. Uh -huh. And if, you know, if you've never read that book, you, you, people should. You know, it's a great book, man, Emerging Real Estate Markets. And so he trained me to always look at the markets. And, you know, it's interesting because I didn't even look at the market on my first passive investment. No. Did I just freaking dove in, man? It's yeah. like, whatever. Somebody brought me a deal. I'm ready, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now I look at I look at these things, man. I love, I geek out on market stats. So. Yes, you do. <laughs> you love that stuff. No, you really do. I and do. It, but, it, but it helps, it helps a ton in the long-term play of whatever the deal is too. Totally, for yeah. sure. What's like, the, that's that's what you, risk return type stuff too. Yeah. So, you know, the historical three to five year historical and projected growth, you know, things like population and income, where do you, wage growth. Where do you find all this information? Is this, is this, just because you have access to all this information, that that's why you use it? or It's, how? it's just right here in my dome always, <laughs> How do you access that? How do you find that information? I look at reports all the time. Okay. Um, we look at – we we subscribe to CoStar. Okay. Uh, CoStar is a little bit spendy. You know, we have a global, you know, national account there. But that hasn't always been the case, man. I will, I'll look at the – first off, I look at reports all the time. Mark is a middle chap type reports. Every brokerage company puts out reports. But I'm also looking at things like the BLS website and just the tracks job growth and that right, kind of stuff. Right. So yeah. What importance do does 
job growth and those type of things play in a deal? Huge, man. Like job growth is job growth brings people to the to the market. It just does. And also job growth is what provides people the and people for our product. Our, that's our product, right? right? People are the product. Right. Our customer, I guess you should say. Yeah. And then job growth also allows them to have a job to pay rent because we want them to be able to pay rent. So job growth is, is the biggest key indicator that we look at and the diversity of job growth as well. That's huge. So, so we talked about operating partners. Yep. Talked about operating partners first. And then we talked about um, the investment strategy of the deal. Yep. And we talked about the market. Yep. And then we, and I want to talk about the story of the deal because you brought up the story of the deal too. Why are yeah. they selling? Why do you, why is it important for you to look at that sto- the story of why it's up for sale even? I'm going to mention one more thing before I forget though because yeah. I believe that it's one of the most important things with the market. We talk about job growth is important, but I want to know how the employment base, like how diversified it is. Okay. Right? We, don't, we don't want any sector, that to, any sector to be more than 18 to 20% of the total employment. So... And the employment employment base, that should be diversified across different employers as well. So those different sectors and the different employers within those sectors, I believe that's one of the most important aspects yeah. of it. And the importance of that being? You kind of have like a smirk on your face. What? No, no. I'm just, it's just – this is such important information. You've never heard me use the word sector? Is that a big word? <laughs> I'm pretty proud of it. No, dude. I think it's important that you're hammering down on this because, like you're saying, what if there is a job in an area that – provides jobs for 80 percent of the people that are in your building and then all of a sudden and then all of a sudden that company goes upside down that's what it. happens so you do it. it's so important that's why i'm yeah. smirking dude it's because maybe it's not something that i've necessarily thought about before i love it because okay, what the, was the, other, the story of the deal though. right right this is as an active investor this is my favorite like piece to put together and i believe that this is where i've been on a million different private money presentations a ton dude because i'm always looking for ways to put, put my money to work but I'm also, I'm, I like to learn, dude. I like to learn all the time. Like, how are people approaching this? And I believe that this is where most people fail in, in, in raising money, it, which is helping people understand the story of the deal. Like, I love putting this stuff together. Like, what's the seller's motivation behind selling? You know, I'm, I'm really trying to understand if that story makes sense. You know, are the current owners, are they burnt out? Are they jaded, uh, you know, in the industry? Are, have they been managing their own property and now they're, they're burnt out and jaded <laughs> because they manage their own? Uh, or they just want to cash out into bigger properties. People ask me this question all the time in the class, which is like, why don't we just hold a property indefinitely, right, when we're actively? Uh, it's because that's – it's very rare that people do that. Like in this market, what we – or in this uh, niche, sorry, multifamily, we buy, we add value, right? So force the appreciation over a number of years, three, five years is average, and then sell. But when we sell, this, people think that when we sell, we just roll. No. When we sell, we then take that money and we roll over into more deals, right? That's like I'm never just I never just want to cash out and keep it in my bank account. That'd make right. me want to puke. Like, <laughs> right? I want to put it to work always. So we're always looking at. So anyway, I want to know the story of the deal. I guess is the point, right? So is, um, you know, last year, a year ago, we bought Charbonneau. I've been thinking about this property a bunch. It's doing great. But those owners, like the story of the deal, to give this example, those owners had bought it. I think it was three years ago. They had a fire right after closing. They skimped on their insurance, which means they weren't able to rebuild that building, burned down a whole building. Uh, then they're undercapitalized as well. Then the owner that, that ran the um, real estate side of their portfolio passed away. And so dude, they needed, they had to sell, right? That story was when I started like looking into all the details and what we needed to do and why they were selling and the opportunities that, that provided us, it was like, Oh, man, I knew for sure it was a home run. Yeah. So, like, when I'm looking at the story of the deal as a passive investment, it's the same thing, man. What is that? You know, what are, their, what are they um, purchasing the property at? And how are they calculating the NOI growth and that kind of stuff? I want to just point out one thing there, too, because you're always talking about making sure to provide value to the people that you're working with. Mm-hmm. And I remember when we were doing Charbonneau, it was a huge relief to them to be selling this property. Oh, yeah. You know, so it, it Oftentimes, when you're understanding that story too, you can build relationships with the seller. That I, didn't that yeah. seller lead to another deal as well? That so, one didn't lead to another deal, but that broker relationship that we met there led to multiple deals. Because we were taking, we took care of the seller. I remember yeah. us being like, because it wasn't, it wasn't the best situation for them, but it's just constantly feeding those those relationships. And yeah. I, I just wanted to point that out. No, dude, let me point. Let me. I'm gonna harp on one more thing there. 
Because I believe that so many people think that it's win lose, right? Right. It's just not a zero sum game. Right. It's not a zero sum game. There can be win win scenarios. Period. And Charbonneau was one of those win wins yeah. for sure. They, they had a ten year term, so a ten year loan, and we're buying in year three. They're selling in year three, which means they're going to pay this huge prepayment penalty. So when you say we took care of the seller, how did we do that? Well, we we got creative to find a way to assume their loan, assume the loan so that they didn't have to pay prepayment penalties. But we that also allowed us to buy the property for cheaper because we looked past our own selfish needs and desires, those kind of things, looked at ways to make it a win-win, and it was absolutely a win-win. So, yeah. so dude, I just wanted to point that out. That has a ton to do with business plan. So I wanted just to, just, just to harp on that just for a second. The next thing that you mentioned was to Did make, you lower my chair? I didn't touch your chair. I feel like you're sitting up higher than I am. Are you trying I'm, to? I'm, I'm, I'm working on my posture. I'm sitting up straight. <laughs> no. All right, I'm doing it too. <laughs> the next thing. No, now I'll relax. No, just kidding. The next thing that you talked about, you know the business plan. You want to make sure that those numbers hit, the underwriting. So business plan is different than underwriting. My, I do want to know what they've underwritten the projections at. Yeah. But the business plan is... Is different, you know. This this strategy that they're looking to 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 do, does it work in that submarket? You know, an example of that. Let's say that they're trying to turn Class C properties, uh, you know, do a value add or a heavy value add on Class C properties and some affluent zip codes, zip codes, <laughs> zip codes. Yeah, right. <laughs> they're going to have a hard time doing that. Like I, I think of we have properties in Dallas and Houston. I think of Highland Park in Dallas, and I think of River Oaks in Houston. That strategy is going to be tough within that submarket. So matching the strategy to the submarket, I believe that that's key. I want to know what that is. Right. What's their hold period? You know, a typical class B, C value add multifamily strategy I mentioned is between three to five years. What's their hold period? What are they? And is that in line with their loan term? And you know, what is the loan term? We'll get into that stuff too. Um, I also want to look at comparable properties. So let, let's say that their plan is to go in and they want to renovate some of the interiors, bump the rents to X amount. Well, okay, I, want to, I want to see a comparable property in that market where that strategy is, like that's post-renovation, where that's you know, been done. Effective. Yeah. Successful. Yeah. It, yeah. It really, yeah. it helps prove that, that this proposed strategy that they're, they're putting into play or that they're wanting to put in play um, is applicable in real life, right? Right. So, and also, what are their post-renovation rents based on? Is that just total speculation? Or are they looking at true com- competitors? Like when we come to a market, I want to look at those individuals who are achieving top rents. I want to know what their interiors look like. I want to know what, um, really, what they're doing, what amenities they have, what are they doing, right? And then, dude, we're going to follow suit. We're going to follow suit. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel, man. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're going to come in. I want to be priced j- rent wise right underneath them. That'll allow us to maximize rents, but also maintain occupancy. Be super competitive. Dude, I think all of these things are so, so, so important, whether you're an active investor or a passive yeah. investor. Because if you're an active investor, you need to know the answers to these questions that Ty's asking. Oh, yeah. These things that Ty's talking about, you need to know those things. So when your passive investors come and ask you these things, you can, yeah. you can talk so to them So now ask me how I learned this. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. How did you learn I it? I passively invest in a deal. Garbage, right? So I'm thinking, man, shit, man, I need to ask better questions, do better research, whatever. And then I'm... Obviously, active. I make. I mean, the money that I make actively investing all goes back into passively investing. That's all just rolls back over. Right. So now I'm actively investing. I'm putting a deal together, and I get on a call with uh, a gentleman. He's from Florida, and I won't say his name on here, but he grilled my ass with so many questions in the beginning. Right. Yeah. Grilled my ass with so many questions. I was like, literally, like writing down, like, God, no, I didn't answer that question. No, I didn't answer that. These are great questions. You know, yeah. like I'm like. Yeah. I say this, like writing it out with my hands, but really I'm typing it out because I don't write shit, you know? I'm writer scram. <laughs> typing it out. And, dude, that's, this person was farther in the game than I am, right? I didn't try to pretend like I knew it all. I was grateful that he was asking me questions that I didn't know the answer to because I was like, bro, these are great questions, man. First off, I'm going to go get you the answers to these questions to let you know that, like, I'm serious about that. Yeah. Second, that's valuable to me, man. Thank you. Like now I can make better passive investments and I can be better at the active side, all the above. So So keeping those things in mind for sure. When you're talking with your investors that they're there, it's never a lot of the times when investors are asking you these questions, they're not trying to challenge you. No, they're not trying to put you down. Yeah. Because I I feel like a lot of times some people get defensive when these questions start coming from investors. Yeah. It's not that. How are you going to challenge me? Of course I've done my research. Right, 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 right. But you should be grateful. And if you don't know, I think one of the biggest things that you're saying right here that we kind of just, 
grazed right over is you wrote down all of those questions, oh, yeah. you went and found out the answers, and then you came back to give him the answers, yep. and that's huge. Speed of execution, man. I'm not – my job isn't to know it all. I'll never know it all. My job is to – uh, continue to learn so that I can make better passive investments for me and my family, and I can continue to make better active investments for me and my family and for my investors and their families. Like, that's a big responsibility, man. Like, it's a big deal. It is, for sure. Okay, awesome. We talked about all these things, and the very last one that you mentioned was underwriting. Yeah. So I just want to just touch on that really quick before we wrap up here. Underwriting. Okay, so under- what do you look at there? Underwriting is what makes my brain turn into mush. Numbers and spreadsheet, I mean, dude, it's not my, I don't love it. Yeah. But you have to know it, dude. Right. You have to know it. So this is where Ryan Woolley comes into play. I'm so grateful for him as a partner because he's a great underwriter. He he's is. taught me a ton on underwriting. And and then we've taught each other about underwriting and, and this is like income expenses, profit and loss statements, all this kind of stuff. To know, to be able to truly understand where the property's at currently, but then to also look at what's conservative and what's what's very aggressive in the beginning if i'm being honest in the beginning when i was doing my projections i didn't know what was conservative and aggressive because i'd never done a deal right it's my first deal so how did i learn that well i did i got mentors i got coaches i got partners i got i learn all the time learning so i want to look at the revenue you know how does their year one performa this is key 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 how does their year one performa compare with the trailing tra- uh, trailing trend report we call it a t12 is the last 12 months right so how does that look where it's at currently compared to where they pro- you know uh, project to be in a year is that super conservative is that um, you just what does it look like you know and check their assumptions okay so if anybody's listening to this and want to take some notes here's the assumptions that I'm looking at I'm looking at lost to lease okay. how quickly they're going to recapture it which is loss to lease is how far below market rents you are. And when you start to raise your rents to, to capture, recapture loss to lease, your vacancy should increase because as you're raising rents, people will naturally vacate. And that's okay. I just want to make sure on the projections that as rents go up, vacancy goes down a little bit, right? That's conservative. I want to know concessions. Are they offering concessions? Are they planning to offer concessions? Do they offer concessions? We, we, very, 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 very rarely offer concessions. Uh, that's part of, you know, choosing your market wisely. Um, employee units, is there employee units there? I'm going to look at um, bad debt. You know, is there bad debt for any reason? And then other exit assumptions, like my return um, assumptions I can or projections I can talk about too. But exit cap rate is very important. Uh, I know I'm just kind of rambling, but no. expenses, I'm going to look at the same thing. How does it compare to the, you know, the performa compared with the, the current data? I want to know how does their expense, how does their expenses, how does that grow over the whole period? You know, uh, you think of uh, inflation. So I'll look at this, okay? So I'll look at the expenses, and I've seen, I, I want to look, have they accounted for inflation each year? And are they conservative with their inflation, or are they aggressive? Like, do you know what the average inflation is each year? So it's in, somewhere in between three to six percent, I think. Am yeah, I wrong? usually two, three. Okay, but this year, dude, it's five, six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I want to know, and we usually project in the four or five range. Right. Why? We could do. We want to be conservative investors. <laughs> so I want right. to see if they've done the same thing. Um, their debt. I want to know what kind of debt. Debt. Debt plays a huge role in these deals. You know. So, what kind of debt have they put in place? You know. What? How? What's the uh, the amortization period? The loan term? The interest rate? Is there any interest only periods? Uh, what's their loan to value? That's he, that's huge too. Leverage is is great, but being over leveraged is not great. So, what's their their um, debt projections? And are those true quotes, or are they just assumptions? Are they just assumptions? Hey, this is where I think it will be, or are they real quotes that they've got from their lending broker or somebody like that? And you need those real numbers and real numbers yep. for sure. And then, lastly, is that I think is probably one of the most important too is your the sales assumptions. Like, is we're exiting a property. One of the ways that people can skew their projected return numbers is the exit cap rate. So anybody passively investing, you should write that down, highlight it, circle it, whatever. But the exit cap rate, you know, to be conservative, that exit cap rate should be higher than the entry cap rate. So if we're buying at a 5% cap rate, then when we exit, my cap rate is going to be higher than 5, usually 50 to 200 basis points higher than the purchase cap rate. And then what are the selling costs as we exit, right? 
And the last thing that I'll mention, and then I'll you know let you wrap it up. I, I, this is all don't do. This is uh, good stuff. We've, well, I know it's good stuff. Yeah, I just no. know that sometimes when we talk about these things, it makes people people's eyes blur over, which is why I said in the very beginning that I'm going to give you this deal screening checklist guide because that's helped me a ton. I know it'll help you a ton. It'll be in the show notes. Download it. Read through this. Learn it. Understand it. Get familiar with it. All that kind of stuff. So, last thing is just the return analysis. Like how are the how are the profits split up between the passive investors and the operating partners. And um, how quickly is the property going to start cash flowing? So. These are all so important things. I, I wanted you to kind of go off on a couple of these tangents on a couple of these things because Tyler is a very successful passive investor. And, this is, and this is how he does it. I, I only know that he's a very successful investor because I got the mail and I indeed saw the check that he got. <laughs> so I'm very, I'm very aware. So if you aren't sure how to invest – this episode very well shows you how to do that totally. successfully and the things you need to be looking at. So, Tyler, thank you so much. You're for welcome, sure. You almost kind of shared all your tips and tricks on how you invest. So this is a very, very, very um, valuable episode for oh, those dude. that may not know how. High level, though, too. Like, yeah. As deep as you think it is, that's high level. So once again, though, man, the, the deal screening guide will check. Will, for sure. You'll see how detailed it gets. And I want to clarify, I don't need to get all those details on every single deal. Like I'm going to grab the ones that are most important, but I know what's most important, right? That's key. Awesome. We usually end Aloha Friday with a, with a, with a Aloha value. I love it. Or okay. a Hawaiian value. What's the, what's going to be the one We're going to do the one that I shared in the uh, Maui meeting. So each love it. first Wednesday of the month, I do a, we do a Maui meeting for the company, uh, all the employees, everybody that's involved. And it was, do you remember what it was? Po'okela. Po'okela. Did I say it right? Did I say it right? so. Shit. You know, I don't know. It's... Po'okela. Is it strength? Courage? Strive for excellence. Strive for excellence. Sorry. I wrote it down. It's in my notes. Yeah, right. I didn't remember. Yeah, right. I'll show you after. (laughs) Strive for excellence in everything that we do, you know? Like, never getting complacent, never getting comfortable. And... uh, I'll tell you the experience I just had that I haven't told you. Yeah. But I just went to deposit that check. Yeah. And I, so on the call, I talk about never being complacent, never getting comfortable. And uh, um, I talked about how there was, I've been laid off. Like back in the day, I got laid off two different times during Christmas holiday. That, that is ultimately, I believe that's ultimately what changed my life, dude, because that created this, like this, this freaking urgency to make sure that I was never in that weak position again. Like that I, that I was, in control of my life, you know? Yeah. And I never got comfortable. I got, it's because I got comfortable. And uh, these small little changes led to big results. And so right after I talk about this on the training, I go to deposit this check. And uh, can't deposit it at the ATM. It's too big. I go inside, and the lady asked me to fill out a deposit slip. And there wasn't enough spaces on the deposit slip for the That's number awesome. of the check. And I, so that might rub people the wrong way, but I, I'm, I'm telling you that because I can't tell you the amount of gratitude uh, that that had, and I was just very grateful for how different my life is, you know, from even a couple of years ago. And that's because I, because people introduced me to this space. And I'm very grateful for that. I had mentors who pushed me, who believed in me, and like, I'm grateful. So strive for excellence. No, dude, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's huge to to notice that because you weren't there a couple of years ago. And now, and now just over time and you working and continually to work at it and all the things you talk about on the growth cast, all those mindset principles that Dallas talks on the daily drips as well. You've implemented those things. Yeah. You were doing those things every day. And I know that you credit a lot of your success or that check that you got to those things. No question. So just another reminder, another actionable do these things that Dallas and Tyler talk about on the growth cast, Put them into play. Put them into effect and live those live those values. I have, yeah. and it's been a short time. It's been like a year that I've been, and my life has changed dramatically. I've seen it. It's been awesome. And it's been awesome. So uh, just another reminder, actionable, call to action. Listen to these episodes daily and put into effect. I don't. I, that's not even what I'm trying to say. But no. use those. Use yeah. those values and do the things that they suggest to do. Knowledge sure. without execution is useless. Yep. Right? Execute on those things for sure. Awesome. Tyler, hey. thank you, sir. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you. And thank you to all the listeners out there. We love you all. Have a great weekend with families, friends, whoever, and we'll see you next time. Boom.